Hey, uh, welcome back to uh, that math thing. I uh, and uh, let's talk some math. So uh, today I am going to start uh, just picking apart some of my academic papers to help um, you know, uh, well, give some flair to my uh, my YouTube channel, but also uh, to help out anybody who wants to actually understand some of my research. Um, so I. Uh, this first project is actually uh, my favorite project out of my uh, dissertation, and it was uh, covering what is called the polylogarithmic Hardy space. What is called, what I called. Uh, I'm pretty much the only person who's ever done any work on it, and um, yeah, uh, how much value there is to the space external to the things I already did there, I have no idea, and it could prove to be a very uh, uh, interesting place to play for some people who want to do something that's maybe a combination of uh, uh, number theory with uh, some, of the, some of these other concepts of functional theoretic operator theory. I found one connection is kind of trivial and so but there might be more so who knows. Uh, so yeah um, yeah so, so where does this, this space come from this idea so um, so it's sort of a blend between um, so you have your classical uh, Hardy space reproduced kernel over space which is sort of a um, Space of functions that are analytic inside the the unit disk, uh, and uh, and then this uh, the coefficients of the Maclaurin series are square summable, right? And um, and when you have that that, that is called the uh, the Hardy space and is a reproducible kernel helper space, and there are some operator th operators that uh, are really important over reproducible kernel helper spaces and others uh, such as multiplication operators. Uh, multiplication operators appear all over uh, literature. Uh, and in particular, uh, they show up in things like systems theory and control, where uh, multiplication operators are become uh, are, are transfer functions. So, uh, so yeah, so uh, I, I, so I, I was doing a lot of work on classification of multiplication operators, the densely defined multiplication operators, not just bounded ones, uh, for uh, my dissertation, and um, and. Uh, and so one of the places where we have a complete description of densely defined multiplication operators uh, due to Donald Saracen uh, is over the Hardy space. And so I was trying to see if I can uh, you know, find other characterizations over other spaces, and, and I had some success once over uh, a syllable space of a single variable, and also um, here, uh, the polylogarithmic Hardy space. Uh, but uh, this one is not quite as nice as uh, some others. Uh, so then there's another space that is fairly interesting to look at, and this is the uh, Hardy space of Dirichlet series. Not the Dirichlet space, but the Hardy space of Dirichlet series. Where basically if you take uh, a Dirichlet series, uh, which is something that's used all over uh, number theory, uh, and so it's basically uh, the sum of uh, a sub n over one uh, times 1 over n to the s, right? And, uh, and Euler was the first one to really investigate a series like this, and, and the, in the investigation of um, the uh, the prime number theorem uh, it really comes up uh, because if you take the zeta function you can uh, sort of factor it uh, according to primes and um, so yeah uh, so I uh, so um, in, in looking into these spaces and the operator theory of these spaces I I've always been a fan of number theory I'm not really a great at it um, but I uh, but I had a I, I was taking an analytic number theory course and so we were studying Dirichlet spaces and a lot of stuff like that. Uh, and um, yeah, I had been studying uh, the Saracen's proof for my uh, for my own dissertation, and then I, I start, and then I was at the the joint mathematics meetings. Uh, I think it was like 2011, 2012, uh, something like that. And um, and I uh, or even was it 2013? Oh, I don't know, can't remember. Um, but yeah, uh, so basically, there's a special session there on uh, functions of several variables and uh, an operator theory over spaces of several complex variables. And I, you know, this is where all the, the big shots and the things that I studied, uh, you know, come to give talks and do other things like that. And, and I never really worked with anything that was uh, several variables before. Um, so I, at, at, while I was at the conference, and this was in uh, San Diego, um, I had a I thought that uh, I can sort of like cram together this Hardy space idea, which is basically a power series with this uh, Dirichlet series, and so I um, so I just sort of uh, came up with some random thing where I was saying well, we'll have this uh, um, reproduced kernel Hubble space, uh, and our orthonormal basis is more or less going to be Z to the n over n to the s, 
and um, and so then those are going to be our unit vectors, uh, and um, and then the kernel you get should be something, uh, whatever that something was. Uh, I had no idea really, um, but uh, you know it was several variables because there was two, uh, and so uh, rather and so you had z and you had s, and um, and it turns out that if you uh, come up with a kernel function for that space, uh, it is the poly logarithm, and so there was a. So they had some sort of connection back to what are called special functions, and so I thought that was fun. Um, yeah. So uh, so yeah. So while I was there, um, my I talked to my PhD advisor about it, and and I showed him this whole poly algorithm thing, and I said, hey, you know, this is pretty cool. I, you know, what do you think about it? And he said, um, you know, it'd be interesting to see if uh, there are any uh, density defined multiplication operators. You know, him being on point and keeping me from running too far astray of my dissertation topic. And, um, and yeah, so uh, so basically, I I spent the next month uh, showing that first uh, uh, the only bounded multiplication operators over the space are uh, trivial ones, so just scalars. Uh, but that's something that the it shares with the Fox space or uh, spaces of entire reproducing all over spaces of entire functions. I uh, all sort of share that idea, um, and that's just because if you have a bounded symbol, um, then uh, you have uh, and, and this, if you have if your uh, multiplication operator is bounded, then the, the symbol is bounded and it's going to be just as analytic as the space itself. Uh, so basically you have a bounded entire function, which means that it must be constant, right? And that same argument works out for the poly algorithm space. So uh, I, so then, um, well, not the same argument, we'll, we'll talk about it when we get there. Um, but then uh, it took a little bit more work and I eventually showed that there aren't actually any uh, densely defined uh, non-trivial densely defined multiplication operators, and uh, and that was a lot more interesting of a result because this turns out to be the first space uh, that, well, at least that I know of, and I haven't heard anything since uh, I, that where basically um, it's an easy to express space uh, that has no densely defined multiplication operators, and so where the Fox space has no bounded multiplication operators that are not just scalars, um, the you know it does actually have a very rich collection of densely defined operators. And multiplication operators, and so, uh, so then, the, in contrast, of finding a space that not only, uh, you know, doesn't have good bounded multipliers, also doesn't have good densely defined multipliers, it, it was actually rather interesting. Um, so then, I, I went on and I, found, I proved a few other things about um, uh, sort of topless versions of these ideas, and uh, and also um, some other things with a. Uh, um, uh, like a, a transform which connects it back to uh, statistical mechanics, uh, and so um, so yeah. Uh, anyway, so in this video, I'm just going to go through uh, some basic definitions of the poly logarithm and the Hardy space. Uh, I talk about the the transform that I call the Bose-Einstein transformation, and um, and then uh, and then also I uh, show you. Uh, well, uh, then I think that'll probably be enough for this first lecture, and then uh, in subsequent lectures uh, I can go ahead and, uh, and develop the, the rest of the theory, uh, where we'll culminate at um, the demonstration that there aren't any densely defined multiplication operators over the space, uh, and then we'll we'll wrap up and uh, and then we'll have a, a few uh, discussions about uh, you know possible future directions uh, with space that I haven't had the time to look into, and um, and yeah, uh, if anybody else wants to, I mean I'm happy to collaborate. Anyway. Uh, cool. Well, let's go ahead and jump into it. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So uh, I'm using um, a new version of GoodNotes, so we'll see how this ends up working out. Uh, also, it's pretty cold out here, and so uh, I'm not sure how long I'll be able to last without my fingers going numb. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and start out. So to give some context, uh, let's go ahead and start talking about reproduced kernel Hilbert spaces. Um, and so, uh, so a reproduced kernel Hilbert space uh, is a Hilbert space of functions from a set X to, uh, let's say, the complex plane, uh, such that uh, for each uh, X and X, uh, the uh, functional uh, defined by e sub x. Uh, well, let's put z just for uh, as we're in complex plane. Uh, e sub z of f is equal to f of z uh, is bounded 
over h uh, for all x. Z, sorry. Uh, not sure how much I like this pencil, but but yeah, but that's the idea. Uh, so um, so basically, we're trying to find a uh, space of uh, functions that is a reproduced kernel helper space, and it comes with something called reproduced kernel. So uh, so by the race representation theorem, I always spell this wrong. Uh, by the race representation theorem. Uh, for each x, or uh, each z in x, uh, there exists a k of z, case of z in h, such that for all uh, f in h, uh, we have that uh, the end product of f with k sub z is equal to f of z. Right. So we have this function that we call a um, a reproducing kernel centered at z uh, that will uh, reproduce uh, function evaluation at z for all functions in f through the inner product, and so uh, and so this is uh, this is called the reproducing kernel centered at z. So, uh, so then the next thing to keep in mind is that, um, I, you know, x could be, uh, you know, a complex number. It could be uh, a real number. It could be a whole lot of things. And, and so, in this case, I, what we're going to be talking about for the polylogarithmic Hardy space is it's actually going to be a cross between d and c. So it's a function of two variables. And uh, and uh, here C uh, is pretty self-evident. Uh, that is the complex plane, um, but uh, D itself is defined to be uh, this, the collection of all Z in C uh, such that uh, the norm of Z is less than one. And so this is called the disk, and that's why it gets the, the D symbol. But yeah, so I. Uh, so yeah, so that, that's that's where we're starting. Uh, now, if you want uh, some more information on the on reproduced kernel helper spaces, I have a lecture uh, that I, I've already put together, uh, and um, and I'll put a link here. Um, so I, uh, so I, and then I, in addition, uh, what we're going to be looking at I uh, is we are looking at the polylogarithmic Hardy space, so PL two, and so this is sort of the whole point. Um, and this is uh, a function of two variables, like I said. Uh, and so one is z and d, and then the other one is s and c. And, uh, and so basically, it is a set of all functions that look like this. So it has some coefficients, a n, and then uh, this times these uh, sort of monomials, z to the n uh, over n to the s. And this is running from n equals one to infinity. And, uh, and this is uh, holds and these functions have this property where the sum of a n uh, squared uh, is less than infinity. So this n going from say one to infinity. I notice I'm indexed starting at one, uh, and that's because you don't want to divide by zero, right? Okay. Uh, so to put this in context, and so uh, this is a polylogarithmic poly logarithmic Hardy space. And so uh, to put it into context. Uh, there's two other spaces that are uh, very well studied, uh, and one is the Hardy space, and uh, and this is uh, over uh, just the complex plane, and uh, and it, it consists of these functions where it is uh, h uh, squared or h two uh, is equal to uh, those f of z, uh, which are just sum of a n times z to the n, such that the sum, the absolute value a n squared is less than infinity. And here, index is going from 0 to infinity, n equals 0 to infinity. And uh, and then we have the Hardy space of Dirichlet series. So this is studied by people like Hedemalm, uh, John McCarthy, uh, and, and several others. I think SAPE uh, at one point, too. Uh, and so uh, this one I uh, usually written with script h two, 
uh, to distinguish from the regular Hardy space. Uh, this is a function's f, uh, of, we'll say f of s, which is equal to sum n equals one to infinity of a sub n times one over n to the s. And this is, uh, again, we have the sum of a n squared less than infinity. And so putting these guys, uh, a n squared, uh, the sum of a n squared less than infinity, uh, puts you uh, as a heart, as a, um, a Hilbert space, where if you take this uh, the square root of this to be the norm of your functions, uh, then that leads to a natural inner product. I, uh, and so I, uh, so then if we take a look at say the Hardy space, so I uh, the inner product in the Hardy space. So if you have f i uh, of z which is equal to the sum of a n z to the n i uh, and g of z which is equal to the sum of a n uh, say b n z to the n then uh, the inner product with f with g inside of let's say h2 uh, is equal to the sum of a n b n bar n equals zero to infinity okay i uh, and now this leads to uh, a kernel function where uh, we have k z is equal to the one over one minus, let's say z naught, uh, z naught bar times z, and uh, and this will be a reproducing kernel uh, for the space. This is called the Zego kernel or Zegu kernel. Uh, and uh, for the uh, Hardy space of Dirichlet series. We get something really similar. Uh, if f of s is equal to the sum of a n one over n to the s, and g of s is equal to the sum of b n one over n to the s, uh, then uh, their inner product is f with g, uh, and let's put in curly h two, is equal to sum of a n. Let's let's write neater. Sum of a n b n bar. So uh, almost looks identical. Uh, but because of the, the different form of these functions, I, we get that the kernel function k of, let's say, t is going to be equal to, I, uh, let's see, uh, of s is equal to uh, the zeta function of s plus t bar. Okay, and so... Uh, so that, that's interesting, right? Uh, so we have this guy, which is just a rational function uh, that came out of the um, of the inner product space. And we have this one, zeta function. Now, how did we get these? Uh, that's a question. So for the Hardy space, uh, basically what we can see is that uh, you know, z to the n, if you want to figure out what its norm is going to be, uh, so say a norm of z to the n, uh, it is going to be equal to the square root of z to the n uh, inner product was z to the n and h2. Uh, but uh, z to the n is just uh, uh, the series a n z to the n, where all the, or so, let's say z to the n not, so I don't confuse the indices. But uh, but basically, uh, it's going to be z to the n not is equal to a n z to the n uh, with a n equals zero if a n if n is not equal to n naught and uh, a n naught is equal to one right so uh, that means uh, that's a unit factor right because uh, a n naught squared is just one and uh, and then square root of one is just one right and uh, and then note uh, that um, if we have uh, say uh, n naught and m naught uh, uh, the following holds, uh, where we have uh, z to the n naught with z to the m naught is equal to uh, the square root of, or uh, not square root, sorry, uh, it's equal to the sum of, say, uh, well, it's essentially just going to be this. It's going to be zero. I uh, so we're going to have essentially uh, if we write z m naught 
i be equal to sum of bn z to the n and so then it's going to be bn is equal to zero if n is not equal to m naught and uh, b m naught is equal to one and uh, if we take these two guys to be not equal to each other uh, then we see that uh, they are what we call orthogonal okay so i uh, and so this is an h2 so what that means is that we have an orthonormal basis and so i uh, and so we know if i say h has an orthonormal basis i say written as i say uh, this en i n equals say zero to infinity uh, subset of h i uh, then i uh, Aaronshein uh, said this, uh, the kernel function i of zw should be equal to n equals zero to infinity of uh, e sub n of w bar times e sub n of z. And uh, this itself, uh, and this in the, in the Hardy space, uh, that is just gonna mean that we have uh, the sum n equals zero to infinity of say w bar to the n z to the n and that is equal to one over one minus w bar z and so instead of z not here i have w i and so uh, similarly i uh, we have that uh one over n to the s is an orthonormal basis for the hardy space of Euclid series And so uh, what you end up getting then is you have k of zw, or sorry, uh, in this case, I'm using s and t, is equal to the sum of one over n to the uh, t bar times one over n to the s, n equals one to infinity now. And this is gonna be equal to the sum, n equals one to infinity of one over n to the t bar plus s, and this, if you know a little bit about uh, the prime number theorem, uh, is the zeta function. So there we go. So those are two uh, very nice uh, um, kernel functions. Uh, one is the zeta function, which has been studied for like centuries, and the other is the rational function, which is pretty uh, straightforward. So if we take the same reasoning and we look at the polylog of the Cardi space, uh, so for PL2, I we have that, and just going back here. So for the uh, for the Hardy space, uh, we had a series in terms of z to the n, and for uh, the polylog of the Hardy space, uh, we had a, a series in one over n to the s. Uh, so now in this case, we have a series in terms of z to the n over n to the s. And so uh, looking at that, uh, we have now. Uh, uh, z to the n over n to the s is an orthonormal basis uh, for this uh, for the space. Uh, so interestingly, uh, this is a two variables. Uh, so you know we have that z is in d and s is in sort of c. Uh, I'll explain why you can have s in, inside of c, and I've sort of been dodging this question, but here. I think S has to be in half plane. And, but when you allow Z to be inside of D, I, it'll actually enable you to uh, keep S inside of the entire complex plane. So uh, so once we have that, uh, then that tells us that uh, we have a kernel function, say K uh, Z comma S with uh, W comma T uh, is equal to the sum N equals one to infinity of uh, say w to the n over n to the t bar times z to the n over n to the s and uh, combining everything we get n equals one to infinity of w bar z divided by n to the s plus t bar and 
What is this? Well, it is called the polylogarithm. Right, and that's why we have the name, the polylogarithmic Hardy space. Uh, is so denoted by PL2. Okay, so, uh, so then what do we do? Uh, so, I mean, we can talk about briefly, uh, you know, what is the polylogarithm? And it's something that's actually been studied for a good amount of time. I, I, that you have people like Don Zagie, uh, who studied it for a while. Um, but it, it goes back even further than that. Um, so, for instance, if you just take a look at uh, L2, uh, L sub 2 uh, of Z, uh, then uh, what you're going to be looking at is uh, is this going to be a sum? n equals, say, 1 to infinity of z to the n over n squared, right? Or if I just put 1 here, I get 1 over n squared. And uh, and if you had an ambitious Calculus 2 teacher, uh, they would have taught you that the poly logarithm, uh, you know, evaluated at 2 and 1, uh, this is really what we call the, the Basel problem, is equal to pi squared over 6. And so, uh, so there's a lot of special uh, uh, points in the polylogarithm that make it uh, sort of special as for study. Um, uh, this isn't due to Don Zagier, I should clarify that. Um, uh, but, you know, he studied uh, uh, properties of the polylogarithm. And you can find his work uh, elsewhere. It's generally inside of uh, the field of analytic number theory. Uh, but this one, the Basel problem, uh, goes back to, say, uh, 1700s. Uh, and I believe his Euler resolved this. I, although, I mean, you can find tons of, since then, you can find tons of different approaches to this, and, and several are actually in just James Stewart's uh, calculus text. So, um, so yeah, so uh, so what about this? So, so the polylogarithmic Cardi space, so PL2, uh, you know, which consists of f of z comma s, which equals the sum uh, n equals 1 to infinity of a n z to the n over n to the s. Okay, and we're saying that the absolute value of z must be less than one because it's not inside of that d uh, set, and uh, and then we're saying that uh, s can be inside of all of c. Uh, how do I know that s can be inside of all of c? Uh, well, that's a very good question. Um, and so basically, what you can see then is that if I take a look at the absolute value of f of s, I want to show that the series, uh, you know, doesn't really blow up, uh, and so. Uh, this is going to be less than or equal to the sum n equals 1 to infinity of a n absolute value times z absolute value to the n and 1 over uh, the absolute value of n to the s. Uh, but the absolute value of n to the s is going to be uh, n to the sigma where s is equal to sigma plus uh, i uh, tau if you like. And so I uh, so then, if we use Cauchy-Schwartz here, uh, we get, uh, say, this is, uh, say, the square root, less than or equal to the square root of the sum, n equals 1 to infinity of a n squared, times the square root of the sum, n equals 1 to infinity of z, n, z to the n over n to the s, or n to the sigma. And and so then uh, we know that this is finite uh, because this is the norm of f. Uh, but what about this guy? Well, uh, if you take a look, uh, I mean, basically, no matter what, uh, n to the sigma is uh, a polynomial, you know, is bounded by poly polynomial growth uh, by polynomial growth. But uh, norm of z to the n uh, is geometrically decreasing. OK. 
because the norm of z is less than one. So, uh, so then that means that no matter what this guy tries to do, it's never going to outstrip uh, the decay of this. So uh, for S sigma being positive, sure, this thing's going to decay and that's not a problem. Uh, and, but for sigma, say, on the left half of the complex plane, so for sigma negative, uh, then what we're going to end up having is that that's going to be uh, growing. Uh, you know, uh, with some sort of polynomial growth term. Uh, but at the same time, uh, z to the n is going to be decaying way, way faster, like exponentially fast. And so that's going to converge. And so this is less than infinity. So there you go. Uh, so th this, uh, so we've justified uh, s being inside of all of c, uh, provided that this is less than one. If we made an adjustment and we fixed uh, and allowed norm of z to be equal to one, we'd have to uh, restrict s to the right half plane. And, um, and so, yeah. Oh, and I made a mistake. That should have been two, and that should be two there. <laughs> uh, so, and Koshi Schwartz, we should be squaring things. But uh, all my argument just stands right there. Uh, so put two there. And put two there. Okay. So, yeah. So, cool. Uh, so that's the, the poly logarithm uh, and uh, the poly logarithmic Hardy space. And at the very least, I've shown you that uh, the, the series converges uh, for the, the domain that we gave. Uh, you know, Z inside of D and S inside of C. Uh, so, um, so then uh, something I want to talk about uh, real briefly then is uh, something I call the, um, uh, uh, the Bose-Einstein transformation. And I... Uh, and there's this relation uh, for uh, uh, the poly logarithm, and it is this. And so it is gamma of s uh, times the poly logarithm of e to the mu uh, is equal to the integral from zero to infinity of x to the s minus one divided by e to the x minus mu uh, minus one uh, dx. And, uh, and here where mu is gonna be uh, strictly non-positive, so it is less than or equal to zero. And, uh, and yeah, um, and S is in the complex plane, etc. cetera. Uh, and, uh, and so essentially, um, th this comes from statistical mechanics. I don't know much about it. Um, and so basically, uh, the, this is talking about the, we have the density function. I, for a boson, for a boson gas, I uh, and uh, and basically, and this is given by uh, given as uh, n x i uh, is equal to x to the s minus one times e to the x minus mu uh, minus one inverse. Okay. And so, uh, so then, um, basically, this is sort of the the total energy uh, from zero to infinity uh, of this boson gas, uh, at, at where x is the energy level. And so you see that the uh, um, the amount of boson gas at higher energies is decaying exponentially, uh, just because, yeah, I mean that, that's that's growing. I, and so I, I, I don't know much about the, this other than what I read a statistical mechanics book. And, uh, and yeah, um, but I mean, you arrive at this formula sort of combinatorially um, and, and using properties of bosons uh, in order to get it. Um, and, uh, and mu, by the way, is called the chemical potential energy. Not my field, but uh, generally this is uh, this is what it is. Okay, so I uh, so there's a way to, to sort of transform uh, this Bose-Einstein equation, and so a gamma s is equal to uh, times L s of gamma is equal to the integral from zero to infinity of x to the s minus one divided by uh, e to the x minus mu. Just rewriting this uh, minus one dx. And so, if you uh, if you squint a little bit, uh, you can actually go ahead and rewrite it as this. So it's the integral from zero to infinity of x to the s minus one, and uh, and then um, what you end up having. <sighs> Sorry. Mm. Okay. 
it, then you're gonna have uh, lambda times e to the minus x divided by one minus lambda e to the minus x. And here we're setting lambda is equal to e to the minus, or e to the mu. And, uh, and yeah. And so if you, if you take a look at this equation, uh, then uh, you can rewrite it. Uh, so this is again, in terms of dx, this is equal to uh, integral from zero to infinity of x to the s minus one i uh, times lambda times e to the minus x times uh, k i'm putting a hat on here just to distinguish uh the zego kernel e to the minus x dx so here k i uh, uh, k hat sub w of z uh, is the zego kernel one over one minus w bar z so we're going to be working over the polylogarithm of the cardi space and want to make sure that we distinguish uh, between two kernels uh, so, um, so that's kind of cool. So basically, uh, you see, you can get to this uh, something with the poly logarithm uh, by applying this integral transformation uh, to uh, the kernel function. And uh, and so when you use a kernel function on this trans in, in this transformation, you get uh, this sort of Bose-Einstein uh, equation here. And so um, so then uh, that led me to uh, to this theorem. And so we say theorem uh, 2.1. Uh, so we're going to let I uh, f of zs uh, be equal to the sum n equals 1 to infinity of a n z to the n uh, time over n to the s. I uh, and so this will be in PL2. I uh, and uh, if we set g of z uh, to be equal to the sum of a n plus 1 uh, times z to the n and n equals say 0 to infinity i you know and this is in h2 i then we have uh, the following so f of z s uh, is equal to 1 over gamma of s times the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the s minus 1 times z times e to the minus x times g of z e to the minus x uh, dx and this I'm gonna call w of g evaluated at z I uh, say z comma s okay so I uh, so this is what I call the Bose-Einstein transformation. All right, and so, and so what's interesting here is that uh, we are using the Bose-Einstein equation, which inspired this transformation. And, um, and it turns out that, uh, and here we're saying uh, where uh, we have the, the real, S, real part of S squared and zero. This is our sigma from earlier. And, uh, and so uh, W is an isometric isomorphism. Uh, and so uh, that means it sort of uh, preserves the, the distance measure uh, between H2 and PL2. And, uh, and it has an inverse map. of uh, f of s mapping to s star of f of z comma z naught i s star i uh, is the map that sends uh, z uh and z to the n uh to z to the n minus one uh for n equals i uh, yeah for n uh, greater than or equal to one, and uh, s star one is equal to zero. Okay, so, uh, so that's called the, sh the shift operator. Well, it's the adjoint of the shift operator called the backward shift operator. Uh, but yeah, um, so yeah, uh, and so this is what we got. Uh, so we we have a transformation uh, that takes H two to PL two, and uh, and it tr and it preserves uh, the norm. Uh, and so essentially what we're going to show is that uh, we're really going to be mapping z to the n 
to this uh, to one of these ZTN over NCDSs, and uh, and then it leaves these coefficients unchanged. And once we have that, then we know that it doesn't change the norm between the Hardy space and the polylogarithmic Hardy space. Um, and so I. The whole transformation is uh, pretty straightforward, uh, or the whole proof is straightforward if you just know some properties of uh, of the uh, gamma function. And so we have one over gamma of s i uh, is equal uh, times the integral from zero to infinity of x to the s minus one of z times e to the uh, minus x times g of z to the e to the minus x dx. All right, so this is uh, the transformation that we're talking about. So W uh, of G of Z comma S. And, uh, and then um, what we end up having is uh, this is equal to one over gamma of S uh, times the integral from zero to infinity, X to the S minus one. Now we just sum N equals zero to, uh, I will say, one to infinity if we want, of a n z to the n e to the minus n x dx. Uh, and so all I really did here is um, I took the expansion for g, which starts at zero n equals zero, and then I moved this guy on the inside. And once I did that, um, I just shifted the index uh, to start at one. All right, and uh, and so then um, if you go ahead and you uh, move the integral on the inside. And you know this just due to the dominated convergence theorem. So we have one over gamma s uh, sum n equals one to infinity of a n z to the n over n to the s minus one, and now we have the integral from zero to infinity of n x to the s minus one times e to the minus n x uh, dx. And so now I uh, you can see that if I make the substitution uh, where we have replace uh, n x is equal to y, then we get uh, n times dx is equal to uh, dy, and then we can pull out a 1 over n here. 1 over n gets combined with this 1 over n to the s minus 1, it makes it 1 over n to the s, and then the rest ends up being the gamma function. And so this is equal to 1 over gamma of s times the sum n equals 1 to infinity of a to the n, a sub n times z to the n over n to the s, and this times gamma of s, and, uh, and then uh, you can see that this doesn't depend on n at all, and we can go ahead and move that outside. And so this ultimately is the sum, n equals 1 to infinity, of a n z to the n over n to the s, and this is equal to f of z comma s. So there we go. Uh, so we started with uh, the Bose-Einstein transformation, and we went from, uh, we took a function, uh, g uh, of z, uh, which was equal to the sum n equals uh, zero to infinity of a n plus one times z to the n. I uh, and uh, and then we mapped uh, to this function f of z s, which equal to sum uh, a sub n times z to the n over n to the s. And uh, and then basically we see that the norm of g is equal to sum a n plus one squared n equals zero to infinity uh, and square root of that and on the side uh, we have the norm of f is equal to the sum a n squared divide and uh, square root of that and so uh, and this is just the same thing just uh, shifted in index uh, n equals say zero to infinity and so there we go uh, that is uh, the sort of Bose-Einstein transformation and uh, and yeah so uh, yeah, so that, that's a nice sort of connection between the Hardy space and uh, the uh, polylogarithmic Hardy space. And uh, so, um, and so yeah, so I, I think for today, uh, that's enough uh, uh, of a discussion and, uh, and we'll pick up uh, next time. I should say that uh, this paper, by the way, it was published in, um, in uh, Integral Equations and Operator Theory. And, uh, and this was back in 2015. And, uh, and then you can also find uh, preprints on archive. 
And so that if you aren't familiar, this is where uh, a lot of mathematicians will post uh, um, uh, preliminary versions of the work, uh, things that uh, haven't gone completely through the peer review process yet. And, um, and so it's a nice place where you can find uh, a lot of free resources if you can't afford uh, to pay for the, um, for the journal access, or if you're not part of an institution that will pay for it for you. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so you can find uh, these in uh, both these locations. And, um, and yeah, uh, I'll stop here. Okay, so uh, that was the introduction. Uh, so that is the polylogarithmic Hardy space. Uh, it's um, fairly, uh, the, the initial definition is pretty straightforward, and, um, and it's gonna be uh, the interaction between this sort of uh, Dirichlet property, the properties of Dirichlet series and properties of power series, uh, sort of clash that's gonna give us um, most of the, the theorems that we want, uh, that I wanna show you. I, I guess uh, I had a lot of fun working on the project, and uh, like I said, it's sort of my, my favorite little pet out of my uh, dissertation. And, um, and so I thought it might be a fun thing to go ahead and start on. All right, well, thanks for watching, and um, yeah, I'll see you next time.